Um, yeah, so this is a paper that's based on many, many years of work and is using the largest annual long-term tracking of learning outcomes of kids in primary school in any developing country. So we follow about 40,000 children over 100 schools across five districts of Andhra Pradesh over a five-year period. And the testing has common questions between the years. And there's a bunch of technical stuff that goes into this. But the bottom line is that the data with the technique called IRT, or item response theory, allows us to track not just the levels of learning, but the trajectories and pathways of how children are learning over time. And and how the schooling system is performing in getting kids through to a certain level of learning outcomes over time. So that's kind of the main <clears throat> technical contribution of the paper. So in terms of the findings, there's four main results um, that I'd like to highlight. Uh, the first, and this is kind of known from earlier work as well, and we're just confirming what is known, which is learning levels are just shockingly low. Um, and what you see is that even at the end of grade five, only 60% of kids at the end of grade five have reached grade one competencies. And the remaining 40% have spent five years in school and haven't even reached the learning levels of grade one. Okay? So this is known from other work, but it's still just shocking uh, to see that. Now, the three things that this paper and our work allow us to do, which was not possible in earlier work. Uh, the first is looking not just at the levels of learning, but looking at inequality by looking at learning levels at different percentiles of the learning distribution. And what you see so clearly in the data is that not only are there gaps in learning levels early on, but these gaps are continuously growing over time. And so from a policy perspective, it kind of just drives home the fact that you may have reduced inequality in school enrollment, um, but that inequality has just now moved into massive inequalities in learning outcomes, and that's what we need to be focusing on. Now, the third main finding, which is important and new, is that what the learning pathways and trajectories let you do is it lets you see where exactly the flattening is taking place. And what you see is that the flattening starts in grade three. So in grade one and two, a lot of kids are making progress. But by, it's in grade three that you start seeing a sharp flattening of the learning profiles and how kids are learning. And what that seems to suggest is that the kids are significantly behind where the curriculum is. And grade three is when the textbooks expect you to be able to read to learn. And so if you're not able to read the textbook by then, you're basically lost. And so that's kind of explaining, we think, why a lot of the learning profiles flatten, that even though you're spending time in school, so as we saw in Lan Pritchett's talk yesterday, when he did five minutes of a lecture in Spanish, um, it doesn't matter how good the instructor is, if the students are not at the level where the lesson is being pitched, you're not going to learn anything. Um, I could give you a graduate lecture in econometrics, and I could give the most impassionate lecture, and I'm not going to make an impact because it's not where you're, it's not where you are. So, I think that's a really important learning from this. And the last part is then. Recognizing that the syllabus is way ahead of where the children are, what you see is that it's really an education system that's catering to the top 10%. So it's only the top 10% of kids who are making great appropriate progress in this test, and you can see that. The bottom 10% are learning nothing, absolutely nothing, even though they're spending a full five years in school. And the middle 80% is kind of muddling along, making progress, but at a pace that's significantly less than what the syllabus is expecting you to do. And that is a real problem because you're spending enormous amount of money in putting these kids through school. Um, but unless we use this kind of data to reflect on what's going on within the schooling system in terms of learning, uh, we're going to basically not be making much progress on these issues. There's, there's three main policy implications from this. I think the first should be very obvious, which is just that when you look at these patterns of inequality, it just is a wake-up call um, to the fact that as a society and as an education system, we are basically failing these children, right? I mean, uh, Land had this poignant anecdote yesterday about the parent who sent the child to school and five years later in a public meeting said, you have betrayed us, that this is an indictment of the schooling system that my children have gone through and have learned next to nothing, right? Um, and so mathematically, if you look at the fact that there's a basic fact that you've got a whole bunch of first generation learners, 30, 40, 50 percent of the schooling system are kids whose parents have never been to school. So let's not discount how difficult the challenge is, right? I mean, let's think from the perspective of a teacher and educator. It's not easy to get these kids up to where they need to be. So what do we do? Right? So there's only three things you can do. You can either differentiate the curricula and the standards so that kids 
the curriculum and standards are recognizing that kids are starting out at different places. Or you could provide more time to kids to reach the same absolute standard. Or you could say, let me identify children who need the help and provide massive additional resource to them in early grades so that we can bridge these gaps early. Now, the idea of differentiated standards is not politically popular. The idea of giving kids more time might have some merit, but it's not going to help if the trajectory is flat. Because if you're not learning anything from an extra year in school, it's not obvious that an extra year is the right answer. So it seems to me that both looking at the research and looking at what the ethical considerations might be, that the only morally, practically, politically viable approach is to say that we've made a commitment as a society to making sure these kids are getting an education and we're going to identify who needs extra help and give them additional supplemental instructional resources early on, individualized small group if necessary, but making sure that kids are catching up in early grades. Which is then leads to the second main point, right? which is the education system has to have a goal, that it cannot just be, I'm getting kids to complete primary school. You have to have meaningful learning goals. And it's important to not try to do too much, uh, because there's a risk you do nothing in trying to split your attention across trying to do everything. But a goal like saying every child should be able to read to learn, that you achieve minimum reading competencies that then allow you to pick up a book and learn by grade three, would then focus the mind of the entire education education system and what is it going to take to make sure that kids are functionally literate and reading by the time they're in grade three. So that's kind of the second main policy recommendation. And the last one, I think, is just highlighting the importance of this kind of data collection and longitudinal data. Um, and it's kind of shocking um, that you spend billions of dollars. Um, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars a year in India uh, on an education system. And you don't spend even like a tiny fraction of that in terms of tracking how the system is performing. So from a cost effectiveness perspective, it's going to cost you less than 0 0.0 or 0.1 percent mean of the education budget to collect this kind of systemic data. But it's kind of shocking that it's taken external researchers coming in to put together the first longitudinal data collection effort of the sort. So what we've done in 8P is one of the first large scale efforts like this. The LEAPS project in the Punjab province of Pakistan is another great example. Um, Young Lives has been doing a phenomenal job in kind of highlighting the importance of long-term data collection following a cohort over time. And I think as we want, in a world of limited resources, and when we're trying to make the most of public, of constrained public finances to maximize our social goals, it's kind of crazy um, that you think you could do this without better data and without better evidence.